In the last 20 years, America's high-tech Silicon Valley has transformed the world of business. Information superhighway now produces a millionaire every minute. But with this explosion of sudden wealth comes what some are calling a new disease. Across the country, a new industry of experts are reporting on the harmful effects of getting rich quick. It's very hard for people who have come into money to see themselves as having problems. They have exactly what most Americans believe should be the panacea for all of their life's problems and difficulties. It's a crazy assumption. These dot-com millionaires may have a big house, a big car, and a big bank account, but what really happens when you wake up one morning and realize you never have to work again? affluent suburb of Silicon Valley, Kathleen and Steve have just bought a $7 million house. Kathleen sold her dot-com business for several million dollars last year and no longer has to work. But she's finding life at home far more demanding than she'd expected. I call myself a recovering working mom because when I worked, it, you know, my life was compartmentalized. I had, this is my work time, this is my workout time, this is my kid time. Um, and you could set your watch by my schedule, and I've, um, now it's all kid time. And uh, it was so much easier to compartmentalize when I worked, and now I can't. Now it's all kid time, and, <laughs> and it's good, and I'm, I made a conscious, um, I make a conscious effort not to do the scheduling thing, and it's really hard because we all live like that. And this would be Principesha. Hello, yes we do. She's pretty dirty. Yes you are. Can you say hi Katie? Can you say hello? This is Katie and this is her brother Daniel. Hands please. These are the twins. These are the twins. So this is Trisha. Hi there. And Julia. You're eating your tag. Wait, you found my tag. I moved down here from Marin in um, 90, and I called a friend who gave me, you know, the pediatrician, the, the dentist, the this, the that, and, uh, you know, after Brandon was born. And she had said, you have to do the Child and Family Institute. It's just such a sweet group of people. We send peace and love. We send peace and love to everyone. To everyone. We send peace and love. We send peace and love. For guidance, Kathleen has turned to the Child and Family Institute, an organization set up to teach parents like Kathleen how to relate to their children and how to spend family time together. We love you, we love you. This area attracts what you call a type A personality, which is a high achiever, and control is a real part of their lifestyle. Many of them are Stanford graduates to get into Stanford. You have to be of that type, that you're in control, you're a driving force, you're going to make it happen, and you do. But what wakes them up periodically is all the best laid plans sometimes still don't work. And they stop and they say, whoa, you know, this isn't what I planned. I had a mother call with an 18-month-old and ask me if there was a computer program to calendar the 18-month-old's days. 18 months. They lose sight sometimes, I think, that they're dealing with children who have an inner call and may not go the direction they're planning. And that's a hard thing for them to, to hear and see. That child is such a wonderful, cohesive force, and it just levels everyone. And you just become Timmy's dad or Mary's mom, 
and that's the uniqueness of it. It's just, and it's being, it's being in an environment where it's okay to reach your heart space, to communicate from the deepest place of who we are, and we model with mom and dad ways of really speaking directly to that child in a way that will live in them forever. I love mommy, I love mommy, yes I do, yes I do, and my mommy loves me, and my mommy loves me, loves me too, loves me too. Is this it? Oh, I think it's the next one. I wonder if we know anybody here. The Institute also arranges mother and child tea parties in private homes, an opportunity for Kathleen and her son to spend quality time together. Knock, knock. Hello, hello. <laughs> I get to see your other half. I remember, do you remember Kathleen? How's your new house? You having a good time there? Oh, it sounded like a wonderful place. <laughs> Who has the key? I have the key. <laughs> Who has the penny? Let us see. Now we are the ones that go around, so everybody take a step in and put your hands behind. Who will get the penny? Wait and see. Maybe I will get the paper clip. I will get the oh, Excuse me. So everybody gets to go to a different little magical corner to have their tea. Just you and your mom. We're going to all find you. Oh, there we go. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Oh, okay. Excuse me, Here's somewhere for someone. Let's see the places you can go for tea. Let's look at some of the places. Thank you. Mmm. Oh. I'm trying to guess what kind you want to make. Huh? Cinnamon. Yeah. We will get our dog. And the delight in just being able to have the ice cream. Those are profound moments. I love that smell. Are you making your headache any better? Mm-hmm. It really helps my headache. It's where if you get more than me. Mm. Millionaires Susan and Mark Ellis are software designers. It's the summer holidays and they're putting their kids through an intensive program. Their son Paul is at computer camp and they're attending his open day. In the last few months they've made over 20 million dollars in the dot-com boom. I can just draw anything. Susan's given up working but Mark's busy setting up a new company. So you drew those? Basically... Um, this is the basic what? thing then window color I guess would be this you have to create rules for it and I don't have that I didn't create any a big key component of Silicon Valley is competition in the workforce if you're not willing to give 18 hour days seven days a week you're told you can be easily replaced well, what that builds inside someone is that sense of drive, I have to stay ahead, I have to keep up. Well, this filters down into the family in that they want the best for their children, they want their children to be able to keep up. So consequently, they over-schedule them, over-provide for them in the hopes that they will have what they need in order to keep up when they're in the workforce and I can create any character um, by drawing them and then coloring them. All right, good work. 
And my husband is busy coaching a girls softball team. It's an all-star team and they practice every day. His games are at 8 in the morning, 1 in the afternoon, and 6 in the evening on Saturday. Margot is going to an overnight camp for two weeks. It's near Yosemite. They do water skiing, archery, and softball, and drama, and crafts, and the whitewater rafting. Paul did golf camp last week and computer camp this week, and today I signed him up to come here again next week. So we've got people coming and going all the time. Hi, Susan. Hi. Where's the family? Well, they're in the kitchen. Hi. You work hard and you do your best, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make it, so... Then, then you start seeing like, okay, it looks like we're going to make it. And then the last you know, nine, 12 months, nine months, the, or, well, maybe a little longer, but anyway, the stock market and technology stocks have just been going through the roof. And that was, we were shocked. What was your first response? Don't believe it. Yeah, just uh, not real. Um, yeah, just, just how can this be happening? We never would have dreamed that the stock would appreciate that much. Never, just never. How much pork fried rice? Pork. Pork. How did you tell your kids? Oh, we've kind of leaked it out a little bit telling them that the stock in Mark's old company went public and we're doing really well and kind of left it at that for now. We're happy with our lives the way they are and we don't want money to disrupt that. Hi, can I place an order to go? Um, chicken chow mein, one quart of hot and sour soup. If you don't know how else to handle it, you can just pretend it doesn't exist. Is this one okay, Paul? Yeah. Okay, okay. Bags out here. Okay, bye-bye. See you later. How did your family respond to you coming into wealth? Um, my family doesn't really know yet. Uh, my family is just my two sisters, and, um, and I have an aunt and an uncle and a cousin, and that's, that's it. I told one sister that we would made quite a bit of money, but I didn't tell her how much, and she doesn't guess. So I eventually we'll let her know. And, and what was your fear about telling the family? Um, well, I, I, I want to avoid jealousy, and I think that's an issue not only with the family, but with neighbors and friends and things, that you don't want a situation where um, people start to think about you differently um, because you, you suddenly and luckily <laughs> have way more money than they do. Why, you know, why couldn't they have been so lucky? And you just don't want that to enter into your relationships with people. So we're, we're going to play that pretty, pretty low key. Just letting our anxieties go, letting our thoughts go. The family's financial advisors are worried that Mark and Susan haven't come to terms with their sudden wealth. So they've invited the couple to attend one of their $500 a day money therapy groups. But Mark's too busy to go. And seeing if we can uh, just notice the few moments that are there that are clear for us. And returning to the breath that uh, creates the power of meditation that adds flexibility to our lives around innocent beliefs.
as you come out of the meditation now, you might just uh, see if you can continue to have a flexible relationship to the thoughts that do arise. I'm finding this really an interesting time to explore um, how I was brought up about money, the various attitudes in my family and uh, my parents and my grandparents, and um, to really re-examine whether those were good attitudes or bad attitudes, and just take the opportunity to choose what kind of attitudes I'd like to have, what, um, what, what we'd like to do with our children, and just how we want to handle the situation. And uh, about the only thing I, want to, I know right now is the money's not going to control me. If I have to just be in denial and pretend I don't have it and I'll make me happy, that's, <laughs> Great, that's what I'm going to do. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Who else? Hi, my name is Dana. I met George at a, uh, at a um, panel discussion on the soul of money um, just a, little, a couple months ago and got his book. And um, I am an entrepreneur. I've been in the technology industry for the last 15 years. And so I built a company, went through one company that went public. I built another company in Seattle um, six years ago that I just retired from uh, at the beginning of this year, stepped down as CEO, and am going through a huge life transition with that. Entrepreneur Dana Brutig lives in the Napa Valley north of San Francisco. She's retired and lives on her own vineyard. I got on an airplane on Monday nights and I stayed up there on Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays and I came home on Thursday nights and spent Friday, Saturday, Sunday here. And when I was there I worked, you know, 18 hours a day. And when I was here, I was home. And do you have a husband? No, I'm divorced and that was one of the uh, been just recently divorced over the last uh, year and a half. Um, coming home was one of those things that sort of, we were kind of separated during that four years because I was up there and he was down here. And it caused a lot of things that were always there in the marriage to just kind of come to the surface. And by the time I got home, it was very apparent that there was time for a change. And after 20 years, it's a hard, hard transition to go through, but it was the right decision. It was definitely the right decision. It's the 4th of July and Dana's giving a party for her neighbors. I was going to be a local. I finally said, I want to, I want to separate, just do a trial. Like within three days, it was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. The kids are light. I keep saying it was like, it's like, the, I felt like um, the munchkins, you know, it was like, come out, come out wherever you are. It was like suddenly they were like, you know, and I knew from that day forward that like this is right, and they've just blossomed. This whole year has just been, they're so, they're different children. They're just different. This is my son, David. <laughs> and this is my daughter, Caitlin. What are you going to do today? <laughs> Another beneficiary of the dot-com boom is Brian, who's recently inherited a fortune. He lives in San Francisco and still lives in the same house. His girlfriend Janine died of a heart attack last year and left him over $2 million worth of dot-com shares. This is shortly after we returned from the Grand Canyon. She's smoking a cigarette and I'm telling her, you're sick, don't smoke your cigarette. So she's sticking out her tongue. Uh, <laughs> she says, so have you put your retirement stock, as, me as the beneficiary? And I told her, my retirement thing isn't going to cover burying me. And so it's, uh, it, was, it was just kind of funny because we we, we'd often laugh about that. She made three times what I made, uh, money. And, uh, so, and so we were laughing about it because it was, it, it was just funny. And so I told her, you know, oh, and so she told me, um, you know, if I ever pass away or if I pass away, you're going to be rich. What are you going to do, do you think, with, with the money? 
it's hard to give it a lot of thought because there's no one I can talk to about it. Because most people I associate with, it's fairly unfathomable, just as with myself. My experience, my background, isn't having a lot of money to spend. I'm not used to being real tight with the money because if all I have is a very little amount of money, it doesn't matter if I waste it. Suddenly I have all this money, but I realize if I waste this, I'm really, I'm really screwed. Had it happened with Janine still around, we'd get an RV, we'd retire, and we'd travel around. It's what we would do. Do you think that your, your relationships with your friends has changed since you got this money? Um, well, one thing is now, uh, now I can be more generous, and, and if we go out or do something, I understand that they're under more restraints than me. So I, I pick up the tab, and I feel good about that, but then on the other hand, there can be a lot of resentment, because it's easy for them to, to see that I'm saying somehow that they can't provide, or they can't, uh, somehow I'm better or something, which is uh, so much the opposite almost. Because I, I feel that most people who are working and, and whatnot have their act together more than me. Brian still keeps in touch with one of his old workmates. This is a store I worked in when I was a working man. <laughs> hey, Bob. Hey, Brian. It's when you getting out of here. After I complete this. What do you think? Five minutes? Four minutes? Yeah, three minutes? minutes. Is it Sierra White? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, here we go, my desk. This is it. Used to mix the paints. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, this is where it happened. This is where I put in eight hours a day. What nightmares it brings back. When I went back to work, every day was as if Janine was still alive because I was doing the exact same thing. And so when lunch would roll around, I would expect the phone call. Want a job name? Shrug off the coffee today if that's okay. <laughs> and so when I received the first check for $50,000, my coworkers looked at me and they said, why are you here? So that's when I decided that I would not go to work anymore. And so the relief from that is just overwhelming. Just jump in. I just got a ticket for a hundred bucks. In your neighborhood for double parked. <laughs> Look at this. Is this ridiculous? I have no idea how to turn the TV on in this house anymore. Ah. That good. I think it's hard to be better. You do? I love that guy. Sure. How many people work here? We have Julia, who lives with us. Um, she's from Peru. And uh, she actually has four children in Peru. She's sending money home, and she'll go home in a year and a half or two years. She does a fair amount of the housekeeping, and she helps with the children. Tricia is now more of my assistant, and she kind of does a lot of running around, and um, she works three days a week. I think we're going to need another housekeeper, though. I think this house is way too much for Julia. We have a gardener, and then there's a pool man who comes. This property is like running a small village, and it's kind of ridiculous, actually. I don't know very much about feng shui, but there's something about this kitchen, I think, that it's, it's good in here because it makes me want to cook. I mean, I like to cook, but just, I walk in here and the first, the first Sunday, oh, hi, honey. Oh, hi. Lord, there would be the, um, the husband. <laughs> there's daddy. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. He is in the kitchen. It's a what? In the kitchen. What do you say? In the... Cracker. Are you putting a cherry on a cracker? You are a This is our charming boy. old son. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Yeah, very, yeah. Usually it, uh, it's closer to 
Nine. Nine. <laughs> Nine. Yeah, at, at the earliest. It's been hectic. And she gets mad at me every now and then. But it only lasts for a little while. Huh? Oh, you know, that, that kind of work versus family stuff? Me? Angry? <laughs> Never it's happened. Not my character. <laughs> big lie, big lie. Katie, are you going swimming? Katie. Kathleen's having some problems with her domestic staff. She set up a meeting with her nanny agency to discuss her concerns. What I'm struggling with is since Julia's four children are in Peru, and two of them she sent, I mean, they, she sent her kids back home when they were, the younger two were the twins and Brandon's age. She's really kind of, she pours her love into the kids, which is wonderful, but if I leave the house for more than an hour, I have to work really hard to get, I mean, I don't leave the house because I don't want to fight for my children's affection and it's really hard. Mm -hmm. So Steve was saying, gee, you know, if you find somebody to do more of the housework, then you're freeing Julia up to be with the kids more. Oh. What do I do? Do I get somebody a couple days a week? I adore her, and I don't want to say don't love my children, but I also don't want to feel like if I leave my house, you know, and I, I, I definitely want to keep her. Steve was making breakfast for the kids, and Julia was sitting there stroking Daniel's back while Daniel was playing instead of, you know, <laughs> right, <laughs> like he wanted to say, you make breakfast, let me be with my son. Right. And, and um, Julie was holding, yesterday I was doing laps in the pool and I had her sit in the hot tub and she held, was holding on to Katie and I had a, you know, tail end of migraine and I finally said, she can sit on her own. She doesn't have to be held. She's two and a half, you right. can put her down. Right. And it, it was, it, it was mm -hmm. unkind of me, but at the same time, I just, I, it's just, you know. Really, this is a juggling act. Whenever you get into a multi-staff situation, right. it's, it's like when you ran your company. I mean, right. But it's a whole, it's a different kind of a thing. I you know. get into jealousies and, right. and you get into managing them and their feelings and well, their emotions around that. And that's why I let go of the other housekeeper that I had one day a week. One, she got lazier and lazier. And two, You're going to be on TV over in England. This is Victor. He's a uh, Mexican. Bueno. Si. Yes, someday, baby, when I'm six feet in my grave, you won't keep running around and cheating and lying and treating me like a low-down, dirty slave. All right? Brian, you're not tempted to get someone to do your laundry. I, I, yeah, that would be great. Someone to do my laundry and, and stuff. I, I'm a pretty private person, though. It might be hard to believe that, but I, I suppose if I, I, if I did it and started having it done, I would enjoy it. But it, uh, again, it's something so different than anything I'm used to that. You know, most people when they get rich, they dream of having servants. Oh, I, I dream about having servants too. <laughs> ones that ones that respect me or something, but I just don't know that that's going to happen. But as it is, uh, you know, still doing my own laundry, still do my own dishes. Uh, still, I, uh, Do you think you feel guilty about the money? Yeah. Yes, I feel very guilty about the money. Um, it's, it's just me, the, the way I got it was just so bad. It's just so bad. It's just so unfair. I could see it fair if it was her spending the money in a sense. But I think it was just luck or being in the right place at the right time. Brian has also been advised to attend the same money therapy group as Dana and Susan. His financial advisors think he needs help to overcome his feelings of guilt. First, we're going to be talking about and uh, what uh, and uh, your earliest childhood money memory that you can think of. Hopefully, uh, you can think of one. So why don't we uh, find somebody that you do not know and get into twos? Um, 
yeah, so, so my, my father, he was a, a lot more spendthrift, and he seemed to live for the day, and, uh, you know, why have the money if you're not going to have fun with it, if you're not going to do something with it, whereas my mom was a lot more precautious, and what are we going to do about tomorrow, and what if we don't have the money, and, and, and so she would always worry about it. But no matter how much she worried, it didn't seem like we would have enough. And no matter how much my dad seemed to spend, it didn't seem like we were living worse. So uh, it was kind of an amb ambivalent message about money. Uh, work hard. Hey everybody, you've got 30 seconds to give your money. 30 seconds to identify that, that little um, t-shirt one-liner that attaches to that memory. I suppose. You have to work hard and put everything into it, but that doesn't guarantee anything. You might still not get it. Get a thing. I, I, I know that working hard matters, but uh, I, I also see that a lot of people work hard and they uh, end up with very little. That's 30 seconds, isn't it? <laughs> have a man I'm dating. I've started dating again, which was my first date after not having dated for 22 years. <laughs> we see each other right now about twice a week. No, that was behind his back. <laughs> it was more how he was with my kids. <laughs> David was really bonding to this man and being playful and silly and, and mischievous. There's a line in Gone with the Wind that says, there must be a great deal of good in a man who could love a child so. You gotta catch those. He had a hard time asking me that was a double. because of what I have. You know, his first comment to me was, we come from very different worlds and you may not want to go out with me. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, he used to pick up David and take him to practice. And he goes, I see your house. I see what you have. I know what, you, you know, I don't have that. So it's been an issue, you know, I want to pick up the tab. I want, if I'm going to take you out, you know, I want to be the traditional male. And so, for me, that's a fun thing. It's like, great, take care of me. This is new, and I like it. I like being taken care of. It's a, a very novel experience. Get it! <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had any rounds about money? No, not yet, because we have very clear understanding. Yeah, because it, it, it... He asks me out, he picks up the bill. I mean, ultimately, it would be an issue. But we're not there yet, it's too new. Dana knows that money might create problems in the future, but in therapy she discovers that she still has guilty feelings about her newfound wealth. When I founded this company, I founded it with people I had worked with previously. We um, went through the first 18 months and we could not get a venture capitalist to fund us. So we were pretty much self-funded. We were using all our own money, trying to keep this dream alive of what we were building. We got to the point where I just had exhausted all, my, all the friends, all the family, everybody had it, you know, and it, it just felt like it wasn't gonna happen. And my right-hand man, his name is Corey. Corey came into me one day and handed me, put down on my, on my desk, a check for $25,000. And I said, Corey, where did that come from? You know, we've all given everything. You don't have any money to give me. And he said, I've been holding out on you. There's one fund that Tracy and I didn't want to touch. His wife has lupus. And she needs a kidney transplant. And he said, this is our transplant money. I know you want to give up. But we don't want to give up. So we give you this money, freely, without any strings attached. <laughs> it was painful, but it gave me the power to go get, the, you know, to really re-energize me to say, I'm going to make it happen for Corey. So one of the happiest days was handing him back that check, you know, it, but it's, it was, it's a painful memory about money and what people are willing to do and and it's painful because of the belief, because it meant that he believed in me. Yeah. And that's the, the essence of the pain. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. <clears throat> I mean, it's a, a wonderful story in a way. It brought tears to my eyes. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, knowing that it was a, a difficult story, uh, I felt a, a touch of horror as I became aware of, of what the consequences might be uh, for you. And when I heard uh, about your employee coming in with the $25,000, with the, the money that was saved for lupus, I had a lump in my throat and tears in my eyes throughout, the, throughout that entire piece. I felt sadness. And then as you spoke about the um, finally finding the, the venture capital, I felt release and a sense of easing of tension throughout the chest and, uh, and shoulder area. Great. Anything else that you'd like to share about the experience? My heart isn't pounding anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I'm glad it's over. Yeah. <laughs> great, great. Thanks, Dana. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's give Dana a round of applause. We're downtown San Francisco. It's about 10 blocks away from the financial district. It's a whole other world, tell you the truth. Uh, people living in hotels here, uh, just hustling to get by. Little storefronts. People living above the stores. I don't think this is the wine country that uh, <laughs> some of those Silicon Valley people are used to, but this is a wine, wine country I'm used to. It's a hard time. Hey, Bob, how was your weekend? We didn't do much. It was all right. My financial advisors, they set me up with this workshop. It seemed to be filled mostly with people who, you know, they work too much and they don't live enough and, and now they don't know what to do with themselves and so they got to go to a workshop or have therapy or something and have someone else tell them, you know, kick back, enjoy yourself, uh, live a little, give a little. Uh. I would tell you what I think is that most 90% of this stuff is bullshit. Yeah. And they're just, they want a chunk of what you have, and they use buzzwords and all this and that. You know, if you, you have kids and you run a business, do you need someone to tell you how to be happy or something? Yeah. Well, people make their careers doing seminars like that. You know? Yeah. I think they're parasites, <laughs> actually. The people making the money off their edge. <laughs> Parasites. Yeah, how was the session? The money session. Did you get any money? <laughs> no, I didn't get any money. <laughs> if it's a money session, you don't get any money. Well, got a few things to learn here, dear, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> the same group as yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. It was there. They recommend yeah. giving 10% of your monthly cash flow away. We can work with that number a little bit to figure out kind of where we are and... When you say cash flow, that's going out or coming in? Going, going out. Does this depend on how much is coming in? And do you feel pressurized in any way since you come into money that you should be philanthropists? Um, not yet. We've, we've been told that people will start asking us for money. Um, it's been suggested to me that if I need any more activities to fill my time that I should go find an organization that I'm really passionate about and volunteer my time as well as um, give them money. So it's um, been proposed as kind of a next career for me to be involved with some kind of charitable organization. Once our names are publicized as donors, people will look at the list and say, oh, I know Susan and Mark. 
I'll go ask them about donating money to improve the tennis courts at the high school or whatever the cause is. You know, for us, we're still kind of in the stage of, well, we have no idea how much we can afford to give away. We. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in the Napa Valley, Dane is contemplating her future and trying to find a new life after wealth. I think at a certain age, people start saying, what is my legacy? What's my life been about? When people remember me, what will they remember about me? And then when they start tallying that up, they go, I don't like it, <laughs> or it's not enough, I, so I want to change it. I want to create something that will be meaningful to me. People have this, this like search to have more um, more of an impact on the world than just that, than their family, or you know, they want to have something that says, this is who I was, this is what I thought, this is what I believed to be true, and this is the way I impacted it. And that's why um, Rockefeller set up his Rockefeller Foundation, and Ford set up it, it was their legacy. <laughs> if my children can talk about me in a way that is they admire me. My daughter Caitlin came home with a, a school assignment that said they were. It was like for Women's Day, Women's Month or something, and it said the, they learned all about all these great women, and then they had to write an essay: "The woman I admire most in the world." And Caitlin wrote, "Is my mother," and I have that hanging in my room because it's like that's easy for a ten-year-old to say. If she says that at thirty, I will. I will be very, very content, peaceful. That's what I want my legacy to be, is, is for them to say, here's a woman I admire. That's my goal, to influence others. What I want you to do is just close your eyes for a minute. And just sit quietly. And breathe in and breathe out. In Silicon Valley, Kathleen's decided to attend a women's group to help her cope with her feelings of isolation. It's called Voices of the Heart. Just notice the silence. And then repeat after me. Pay attention. Pay attention. Can you say it with me? Tension. Tension. Be at peace. Be at peace. Trust. Trust. And then open your eyes. Can you feel the difference here? You feel how quiet it is and how centered and calm you are? And this is a big part of what a lot of us feel this area needs, is for it to start with people like us and kind of reclaiming that stillness and that silence. And it's about being. I realized when I stopped working and I was with my children more that I had to stop completely. And because otherwise it's, you know, hurry, hurry, hurry. And children don't hurry. They actually, it, they're very zen. Yes. They're incredibly zen. And the whole idea of mindful everything, that's what they do naturally. And in order to get there, and enjoy your children's lives, you have to stop yeah. everything. And um, it's, I think it's a hugely difficult transition. Just, you know, just being an adult and trying to do that with a child and in this area where there are a thousand things that you think you should be doing. And really there's one thing and that is stopping to be with your children if you're mom, you know? The same with the teas like we did yesterday. You know, it's been just fabulous to do those for the past year because, yes, it's on your schedule, but you go and then there's, no, there's really nothing. You're, you know, the storyteller's going to take over and you don't have to do anything except just be there and have a nice, quiet time. Tell me, what is it about a cup of tea that is, or what do you think about when you stop to have a cup of tea? I mean, you, you don't drink it down fast. You know, that wouldn't be drinking tea. Can't gulp it. No. no. So it's actually stopping and taking time. 
And did you love this word, indulgence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about, um, it's a real luxury. You know, there's an mm -hmm. element of a real mm -hmm. luxury, indulgent time. And just the making of it. Yeah. It, take, it has some steps to it. Right. You can't just whip it up. Mm -hmm. You don't do tea in a microwave that I know of. If you do nope. the English tea, you yeah. turn the pot three times mm -hmm. for luck. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Ah. And then, um, and then uh, the the um, whole Japanese ceremony where mm -hmm. you offer a couple a cup of tea with two hands, mm -hmm. and just and there's so much ceremony around tea, yeah. not coffee, no. tea. Mm -hmm. It's a ceremony. It's a sharing. Often people have tea together. Uh, it, you usually sit down. Think of it, what a concept, you know, mm -hmm. sit down yeah, to have tea. Oh. <laughs> well, I guess I'll give you a little assignment. And your assignment is to, before I see you next time, is to stop and have tea. Just savor that moment. Just be in the moment of having the tea. <laughs> Let me just say that um, this is all confidential. Because confidentiality, I think also in this area, there's a lot of fear about what someone else might know. And I know that's the valley voice. But we all, we all need a place where we can share the things that are close to our hearts and, and the things that we're afraid of. And, uh, and by sharing them, of course, then they usually, they often resolve. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much thank for having you. us into oh, your home. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Oh, you hug I mean, for your daddy. Oh, for your daddy. Oh. <laughs> This was great. I really Thank would you. love to be in a group. You would. I would really love to be in a group. Yeah. My feelings about Silicon Valley are that the economy does shape people quite a bit. I think everyone's driven to succeed. Everyone's driven to make it. A lot of these people, they scare me. They really, really scare me because I just see that morally they can almost justify anything by the money. You're really not somebody without the money. Like, you can't be a good, decent person unless you have the money. It almost becomes like a religion. Once you're in it, anyone outside of it isn't, isn't, isn't really... Uh, wholesome somehow and I think some of these people believe that with the, the wealth that that if you're not striving for money and if you don't realize that money is that important that, that you're you're outside of it and that maybe you're uh, un-American even